Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be uh, to be here. And first of all, my thanks to the ECB and the team here for hosting the conference or co-hosting it with us, but on your on your premises. And thanks also to to the teams, both in FISMA and in the ECB, for all the preparations. I know there's been a lot of work going uh, into uh, into it. Interesting times, as we always say. I think we are at a very uh, interesting, of course, political juncture. The Commissioner referred to that already. We just came out of the European Parliament elections. Uh, a lot to be done uh, on capital markets and banking union in, in particular. And we will get back to these topics also later in the panels and having the opportunity, I think, to continue to build on, on some of the interesting, I think, conclusions and suggestions that have been uh, made all, already. But before we come to all that, um, I am going to present to you very briefly uh, our report, the European Financial Stability and Integration Report, FCO, we like our abbreviations in Brussels, as you, as you know. And um, the idea would be that I take you through that very briefly. I think it's quite complementary, of course, to the work that's been done here uh, by the ECB colleagues. And I'm hopefully going to not repeat much of what Jerome has been saying. I think he has been very complete already uh, on the integration side. And we, of course, share very much the ECB's analysis. And by the way, also, we, as you mentioned, we work very well together and we rely a lot on the ECB colleagues for our data. So uh, certainly no disagreement on the assessment of the, of the situation. Now, what we try to do in our annual review is to uh, assess, of course, market integration, and Jerome has spoken to that already, but also in more in general, the economic development over the year. Inevitably, this is a report which is backward looking. So what we looked at was uh, 2023 and the first quarter of uh, 2024. And I will, uh, in the following minutes, just give you a few highlights from, from that report. So that's the, uh, let's say, the main part, the first chapter. And then we always have in the two uh, second parts of the report a little bit of a deep dive uh, on two topics that, of course, are interesting for market integration. But also we try to choose topics that are a little bit topical in the uh, general um, policy discourse. And the two topics this year have been referred to already by previous speakers. And what we've been looking at is the investment fund sector in the EU, very linked, of course, to the uh, conversation, international conversation, and also uh, the BFI uh, question. And by the way, we had a question earlier about the uh, role of investment funds in the capital markets union. I think this is precisely where this topic, where this topic sits. And then the last topic, the last chapter is also something that's been referred to already, uh, third country dependencies in the EU financial sector, open strategic autonomy, economic security. You've heard those expressions already. We have open markets, which is great, and our financial systems are globally interconnected, and that's a good thing. But of course, that can also come with some vulnerabilities, and that's why we need to be uh, a little bit um, vigilant on this, on this matter. Turning briefly to the general um, financial situation, and as I said, this is, of course, a little bit of a backward-looking exercise, but as always, we need to understand the past, or we need to know the past to understand the present and prepare for the, for the future. So if we look at uh, 2023, uh, as you will all remember, a, a relatively uh, difficult year in terms of economic growth. Economic activity broadly stagnated, obviously also linked to the overall geopolitical tension, tension that continued the second year of, the, of Russia's uh, war of aggression uh, against Ukraine. And that, of course, uh, was weighing on consumer spending, on economic activities and on everything else. Uh, as always, a slightly divergent situation across member states with a little bit of stagnation here in Germany, but of course, uh, a little bit more uh, growth uh, in terms of real GDP growth. If we look in Southern Europe, countries like France, Italy and Spain. In the meanwhile, I think the forecasts are a little bit more positive. Um, as mentioned, the cutoff date for this report was March this year. We had our uh, spring forecast in May, the EU economic forecast, and there we could actually revise upwards uh, a little bit the uh, forecast going forward, predicting that growth will be picking up in this year, but also in 2025. And of course, um, at the same time, inflation also continuing to um, decline. 
Financial markets uh, fluctuating in 2023, uh, as you um, will remember. Sovereign spread, uh, sovereign bond spread has diverged across the member states. Uh, corporate bond spreads narrowed over 2023 um, and into early 2024, despite rising corporate fund. And you see that, of course, in the in the graph. Stock markets started positive in 2023, but then, of course, we had uh, the turbulence in the system. In March 2023, uh, the failure of the, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank in the US and a couple of other US banks, the Credit Suisse situation here in, in Europe. Now, I think the good news here is that equity markets actually did recover quite quickly. And I think that is also, I think, a proof of the resilience of our banking system here in Europe. Uh, also, obviously, thanks to the regulatory changes we've done over the years but also the very good work of the colleagues uh, at SSM here in, um, here in Frankfurt. Moving then to um, financial stability risk uh, remained elevated in 2023, um, as mentioned, uh, due to the various, of course, uh, geopolitical factors uh, in, in particular. Now, I think also here we probably are in a slightly um, better situation now, and I think a more upbeat financial uh, market sentiment, where we've been talking about the kind of risk of, of some rather uh, rapid kind of asset um, price corrections, but it hasn't actually happened. And I think overall the uh, situation is more upbeat, but obviously, uh, as always, as we like to say, no room for complacency, and we need to remain quite, quite vigilant. In particular, of course, the, the uh, interest rate environment uh, will impact the debt servicing capacity of economic actors uh, over time. What we can see as, is that the profitability of non-financial corporations has been quite strong, but obviously the companies that already were a little bit weaker are doing less well. We do see, by the way, also corporate insolvencies going up. That was very expected also coming out of covid where of course a lot of companies got public support some of them probably were weak already and you can kind of see now when uh, that kind of public support all these schemes are being uh, phased out that we we have got some some uh, more insolvencies again probably not unexpected if that we look at the household situation was over recent year as uh, very low debt service costs. Uh, also, we have a strong labor market, a persisting uh, strong labor market, which of course is a good is good news for the household in terms of income coming in and the possibility to uh, service their loans. At the same time, of course, over time, this uh, is becoming a little bit more complicated, especially in those member states where households tend to have variable uh, interest rates, where of course there can become uh, some pressure on households to service their, uh, their debts. Looking at real estate, um, which uh, is also, I think, a sector where we have a little bit of a diverging situation depending on what member state you are looking in at. Again, I think more, uh, more of a complicated situation in some member states than others also, although by and large, I think we have not seen uh, in Europe maybe uh, the challenges that we have seen in the commercial real estate sector in some of our partner jurisdictions. And then finally, looking at the banks, looking at the financial sector, I think there, um, as always, of course, financial markets do remain very sensitive to the overall geopolitical situations and the various tensions that we, that we see in the market, further interest rates development, and uh, economic growth forecast. I think our banks in Europe, thanks of course also to the interest rate situations, did uh, have good profits uh, last year and the first quarter in, in this year. And I think it's of course a good thing that our banks are, are strong and we will have to see how that develops going forward. Then turning very briefly to the two uh, more, let's say, deep dive uh, chapters in our report, um, investment fund uh, sector. On the one hand, of course, uh, we see that this is a sector that is growing in terms of, um, of assets. And, and Jerome spoke, I think, very insightfully to that, um, to that topic. Earlier, uh, we have a very bank dependent economy, as was mentioned. It's, of course, a good thing that we also, in the concept of capital markets union, that we have more diversified finance. We see that the funds can play a role in 
providing uh, support and financing support to, to the real economy. At the same time, of course, uh, that also comes with potential, uh, potential risks. And as I mentioned already, we have a very active, I think, international conversation around non-bank financial intermediation. We launched ourselves a consultation on this a couple of weeks ago, which will be running uh, until the end, of the end of the year, until December. So if you haven't looked at that yet, please do take your, the time and answer to that consultation. We, of course, want to look at the MBFI sector quite broadly. It's not only investment funds, what we look at in this specific report though in the FC was uh, on the investment funds. The risks here or the potential risks here, well known of course, liquidity mismatches and, and the leverage, which um, if a lot of funds get into difficulties at the same time, may be of systemic relevance. Important to have uh, monitoring uh, systems in place that can make sure that we can react or the funds themselves actually can react in time if you do get uh, these kind of uh, mismatches. And of course, uh, also making sure that the funds have liquidity management tools in place. Now, I think the good news is that in the EU, our investment funds, be it USITs, be it AFMDs, be it money market funds, they are, of course, all uh, well regulated. And we have done some recent changes that are very important in this context. And that uh, is the latest revision to the AFMD directive and to the USIT directive that precisely has reinforced the rules around uh, liquidity mismatches, around liquidity management with the new rule now that um, the open-ended funds need to have two LMTs in place. So these can be things like longer notice periods and redemption gates and, and these kind of measures. And we have the rule also that money market funds need to have at least one additional LMT. So that, I think, should uh, mean that we have already taken some quite useful action in this area. Leverage, of course, um, this is something that can be uh, problematic and needs to be needs to be monitored. Now, in general, if we look at our open-ended funds in Europe, they are not particularly leveraged, but there are, of course, some outliers outliers out there. So, something that we need to be a little bit vigilant uh, with regard to as as well. And then, moving briefly to the, the last chapter, chapter three, and that is the openness and third country dependencies. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's a good thing that we have an open financial system in Europe, that we have uh, a globally interconnected system, that we have investments coming out from, from outside, from coming in from outside, outside Europe. What we tried to do in the report was to look a little bit at um, different, different sectors. Uh, clearly, having an open market means that we have more competition, that we have better access to finance, hopefully, better access to financial services, and that can stimulate innovation. At the same time, of course, it can also come with some vulnerabilities we've seen in recent years. The challenges uh, we may face when we have a too high dependence on third countries, which goes, by the way, as you know, uh, beyond, of course, the area of financial services. So what we were looking at here in the report was actually looking at a bit segments of the financial services sector. So looking at our dependence on, um, of course, derivatives, clearing and settlement, credit ratings, retail card payment systems, and some other sectors, including also insurance and, and reinsurance. And um, I, th we, I think our assessment of what we put in the report is that if we look at these sectors where we have a very high dependence on third countries, these are third countries that are part of our G7 partners and allies, where we are. We sit around the same tables. We discuss in the Basel Committee. We discuss in the Financial Stability Board. We see each other in IOSCO. So I think we have, you know, we can probably be quite confident that these are uh, countries that follow the same uh, regulatory frameworks as we do ourselves. But nevertheless, of course, uh, something to be to be a little bit um, vigilant um, for, and um, I think it's, it's fair to kind of conclude that we will have these dependencies on third countries and their operators uh, in the foreseeable future. Again, that is as such not a problem, but clearly something that we uh, may want to still 
continue to to be uh, paying a little bit of attention to. Um, also, and I would close on, on, on that remark, I think that also brings us back to what the Commissioner was mentioning earlier, and Gilles was referring to it as well, as did Joan, by the way, the policy work we are doing ourselves in terms of building our capital markets union, strengthening our market infrastructures, and increasing access to finance um, for companies in the European Union. And of course, also by the same token, making sure that we get a higher retail participation in our capital markets. And all that, of course, uh, for the benefit of citizens themselves, but also the transitions that we need to need to finance. So I think all in all, um, and I will close on that, um, do take some time if you haven't had time yet to to read the report. I think this was a really a five minutes helicopter summary of um, of our FCR. But hopefully it gives you a little bit of an idea of what the report is about. And I will I will leave it at that. Looking forward to uh, being on, on one of the panels later where we will talk about cross-border consolidation. Well, cross-border, I said the CB word, although the Commissioner had just abolished it. But consolidation in our trading landscape. And clearly, of course, one issue that uh, we would want to look at in the capital market union context. But I will stop there and very happy to take a few questions together with Jerome, if I, if I understand well. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Paulina. So you had the view from the ECB, from the Commission, complementing each other very well. So again, we'll start with questions from the floor, and I will check the Mentimeter for additional questions. So we have two colleagues helping you, bringing a mic to anybody that wants to ask a question. Yes. Good morning, Nuno Amado from Portugal. Uh, two comments. I will ask two comments to Jerome, or two, que two questions that I will raise. The first is about uh, uh, the CMU and banking unit, uh, uh, about the, its importance and um, um, the, where we are in both right now. In my views, I'm not an expert on CMU, but we are um clearly um we have a long way to to go but on the banking banking union we don't have a we have not a long way to go we have a banking union we started 10 years ago as we know and nobody mentioned but it's still in, in, incomplete it's not finished okay and i coming from a brief periphery 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 country i understand i understood that uh, 10 years ago there was a lot of resistances to complete it right now i don't understand really i think we have the conditions on the banking side on the supervision side to complete it but we didn't so don't you think this is an indicator that we are not ready yet for a full integration or for a speedy integration second comment is on cross-border lending i came from a bank so it's easier to to focus on that I understood uh, that cross-border lending is at a low level, but I'm sure that you have some segmentation analysis. And I would guess that on large corporates, the cross-border lending, if you had corporate uh, cross-border lending plus market le market finance, that share will be large on large corporations. I also understand that for retail and for micro and small business local is normal because administrative processes are different because uh, judicial system are different because taxes are re uh, uh, are different so uh, i understand that is normal that for the lowest segment but very critical segment uh, mortgage uh, consumer micros uh, small corporations local institutions have a, pro a proximity and that's not negative that's positive so i understand that probably where we have a, a larger problem is on the mid corps the ones that want to grow and will not have enough access can you comment on this more deep dive uh, 
um, analysis, if, if you have it? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, very uh, relevant questions. Uh, well, I must say, personal view, speaking on my behalf here, uh, I think we've worked a lot. I used to work a lot on the preparation of supervision and, and banking union even before the SSM existed. So I would agree with you, lots has been done. Uh, CMU is a relatively new topic for me, uh, and there are it's also very challenging because there's a lot to do. So I won't come back to that. We seem to have uh, some convergence, as you heard, between what the ECB is trying to push ahead and, and, and what the Commission is envisaging. Uh, I think in both cases, uh, I think we have to deal with uh, member states. I mean, this is a union of differing member states, and they have different views, different opinions, sometimes strong views on some of the aspects. So I would also agree then uh, that the banking union is incomplete, but I would certainly disagree with the idea that nobody mentions it. I think there's a huge number of ECB communication on this uh, about the fact that banking union is not completed. And, and, and I think that's, uh, I won't quote because there's no need for that, I, I think. Uh, maybe that was a bit of a provocation almost on your side because we're here at the ECB today. But anyway, more seriously, uh, I think the reason why it's deemed incomplete is indeed like at least I would say one element is the deposit guarantee scheme, ADIS, even though there's progress there. And I think it was noted by the commissioner, certainly some progress, but it's not like a complete uh, overview there. And there's also, let's say, crisis and risk management. There's something on this among the policy steps I, I mentioned, to take very much a, a group type of approach rather than a collection of nation specific subsidiaries in some sense, even though we have a single supervisor uh, there for banking, we're not yet there. That relates to uh, cross-border lendings, indeed large corporations are doing it because they have the group approach themselves, by the way, uh, very certainly. On the retail front, I agree with you fully, administrative, regulatory, judicial, uh, taxes, differences do not facilitate um, the, the, the kind of these operations. When I happen to talk in banking fora and I talk to people who are looking at consumer lending because they're interested in uh, uh, dealing with credit risk, they also want to have more possibilities to go across border to lend and they say, so it's not the demand side only, also the supply side, they have problems. Uh, and I think there are two remarks on this. Um, I think the, the risk management group level type of thing inside the banks, so they could do this part of the work themselves uh, or have incentives for doing that. If they have a risk management, we see that the group level, both for liquidity and capital, that would facilitate, I would say, the other side of the, of the balance sheet uh, on, the, on the asset mm -hmm. side. And then the other thing, which is a bit like... Uh, well, the, the elephant in the room that we don't see is that we have not seen, I would say, any kind of, uh, uh, I would say, significant consolidation in the banking system, in particular, uh, mergers across borders. Because I think once we have this, even if there's one bank or group of banking starting with this, uh, then I think this would launch probably unavoidably uh, a very strong dynamic I I in this respect. But we are missing it. I mean, I, I don't disagree with this. Ah, sorry. Yes. No, just to add very briefly, I think Joan was very was very comprehensive. I mean, maybe on the on the local uh, banking element, I guess what we also want to look at, I mean, it's not so much an issue of saying that the local baker who needs a small loan to buy a new oven, more energy efficient one would hope, uh, that he would necessarily want to get funding from other member states. I think what we are looking at in the context, I mean, it's normal that that guy goes to his local bank and gets his loan. I'm more, th I think what we are more thinking of in the context of capital markets union is the, you know, the innovative companies, the new, the new clean tech companies, the, uh, let's say, more risky companies, the, where it may be, tr 
more difficult to get the bank loan because there's no kind of history, there is no data to actually show how this company may go in the future. And I think that is probably the segment that we are looking at. And there we think it would be useful if there would be, and I'm not going to say the CB word, but there would be more internal market flows of capital, be it access to venture capital, be it easier listings be it um, you know, business angels or, or what have you. Um, so that on your second point. On your first point, and having followed the CMU debate from the very beginning from 2015 when we launched the, uh, the project, I think it's a little bit a matter, matter of is the glass half full or half empty. I think we have done a lot, as the commissioner said, we, you know, we often speak about collecting the low-hanging fruits. Now, in fairness, some of these low-hanging fruits were not that easy to collect either, but we have done a lot, you know, when it comes to now the new listing act, when it comes to uh, ASAP, as the commissioner mentioned, some changes to the fund regulations that we mentioned. Some of these rules, by the way, still need to enter into application. So they are agreed by the co-legislators, but we have not yet seen the effect in practice. But then again, there is more to be done, and I think there has been a recognition by uh, the finance ministers and the EU leaders that we need to do more on CMU. Like Jerome was saying, I think actually that we speak a lot about the CMU, which is probably a good thing. On banking union, and I think that the commissioner referenced to it, that it is incomplete indeed. We have, I mean, SSM, you know, doing fantastic, a fantastic job here in Frankfurt, seeing a resolution board well established as well. But obviously, the pillar, which would be the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, is missing, and and some more progress would be would be needed there. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Other questions in the room? No. So I have one question. Actually, after that, we have to uh, to go for the coffee break because then Mrs. Calvino is coming at 11. So quickly, one question from the Mentimeter. Uh, we hear a lot about of discussion on capital markets being an alternative to a bank dependent system. But what about the fact that investment and commercial banks are main participants in capital markets? Whoever wants to uh, answer, or both, actually, as you wish. Farina, start. Okay. No, I, I think this is an important, uh, an important remark, and maybe also a, a good occasion to to be very clear on on what we mean. I don't think the idea has ever been to say that you know let's abolish the bank and it should all be capital market financing. It's really a matter of expanding the ecosystem. We have a solid banking sector in Europe that clearly plays a big and important role to finance the real economy you know, whatever figures you use, 75% bank finance, 25% capital market finance, the US, the opposite, as is always mentioned. And I mean, this is the European model. And I don't think anyone kind of think that we will become the US and that we would want to become the US by, by, any, by any stretch of imagination. So I think it's really a matter of expanding that ecosystem, system, making sure that there are other finance opportunities than banks, which is not replacing banks, it's basically making the pie bigger. And as I mentioned earlier, I think precisely in those segments that maybe are uh, less, let's say, suitable for bank finance. It's clear that our banks play a super important role in the capital markets, and that is precisely what they should be doing. So I think the way we have always seen the Capital Markets Union project is a project with the banks, and that we together basically build these ecosystems. So it's really, really important to be very clear on that, that this is not at all a kind of either or, it's really everyone together uh, for the benefit of uh, deeper uh, capital markets in Europe and more integrated market and more access to finance for, for our companies. Well, just a, a few words on, on this. Uh, because I obviously agree uh, with the, uh, what was said by the, the Commission on the extension of the system and the, still within the, the, the EU model. Um, maybe two points, demand and supply related, which would echo somewhat some of the policy uh, points I made at the end of my presentation without elaborating that much on them. I think the, the connection to, to retail or uh, small or more granular uh, demands and, 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 and supply actors is an important element in the expansion of the system. It's not only to go across border, but the scope of the capital market should be should be extended. So if I give two examples, uh, I would say SMEs, for instance, via securitization, they could be or other structured products, they could be more access in particular uh, 
I did not insist on that, but I would support. It was the, the first uh, answer provided uh, by Paulina on, on innovation and, and these kind of things. And, and, and then for retail investors, for that matter, uh, this is about the risk culture, venture capital, having more at the even household level, more, as we see in some countries, actually, uh, in the EU or formerly in the EU, no names given. Uh, we see more risk culture, so I think there, there's the hope that over time, we could also boost this uh, sort of willingness of households to uh, be involved a bit more, either directly or via, for instance, pension funds.